again. Uh, we've had some technical difficulties, so for those that are watching, uh, thank you for staying on with us, and we're welcoming you to our service. And uh, we're just thankful that you are able to watch with us, and uh, we apologize for not being able to hear us for the last 10 minutes. All right. Um, we are going to honor our graduates, and because I am the service leader, I don't have to move. So if Ivy would come up and because we all know that Kim actually bought this um, I'm going to let her talk this is for you um, <clears throat> I'm really excited uh, Ivy Ivy has been um, all the way through. I've watched and Caleb and I have been able to pray into and see her since before she was even in um, youth ministry. Um, I remember changing her name from Ivy to Sassy Pants for um, her first VBS that I volunteered at. And uh, there has been a lot in, I guess, um, I was praying about this last night, and I guess the biggest thing I can say is thank you, because the truth is, is that you have taught Caleb and I just as much as we've taught you, if not more, and that we are better pastors and leaders. You taught me not to be shocked <laughs> by anything, and I mean that in the best way, but to lean into the questions that it's not, there's no thing that the Holy Spirit's afraid of, so there should be nothing we are. And that is a lesson that Caleb and I are going to take through ministry the rest of the way. And it has been an honor to be able to pour into your life. And you, again, you remind me so much of myself and the fact that it shows what the Lord can do with hard work and a strong will. And that you have both of those things. And the Lord gave me a word for you a couple years ago when I shared this with you at the time. Is that you're a leader no matter where you are. You can choose to either lead someone over a cliff or you can lead them to the Lord. And I pray that you continue to walk upright in hard work, in love, in encouragement, and with your strong will. That it will lead you further into the kingdom of heaven and that people will follow you there. We love you so much, and we're going to take some time to pray. I wanted to tell you how proud I am. And you and I have gone rounds, <laughs> and I'm thankful. And I'm thankful for you. But most of all, I'm thankful for what you're about to do, that God's going to use you and move you, and that you're going to do great things because that's what you're called to do, and that's what God put in your heart to do. And that's not going to change. My one prayer for you is that you'd hold tight to the truths and not fall into the lies. But I am really proud of you. And I'm thankful for you. We're going to pray for you. Father, as we... As we once again come and, and we get to send another rural high schooler to, to college and to see them to excel in you, God, I ask that you would continue to bless. Father, that you would hold tight to her heart and to her mind. God, I ask that you would bless Ivy and that you would move in her and your presence would be with her and beside her, that you would ordain the steps that she walks. And that, God, that you would pour out your love and passion into her heart. Jesus. Jesus, I just ask that you would bless and ordain the next steps in Ivy's life. God, that there's no place she can go that you're not going to go with her. 
And Lord, that you would lead so strongly, that your words and your promises and things that you've already spoken and placed and instilled in her by her family and by her extended church family, Lord, that she would carry those. Lord, that you would teach her and continue to walk alongside of her. Lord, that you would be the leader and she'd put you in the driver's seat. God, I ask over this time, Lord, of the summer that she would she would make choices that bring her closer to you. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that Ivy has been to our youth group and to this church. And Father, I just, again, I'm so, so very grateful. I give you all the praise and honor and glory for what you've done, Lord, that through, through Ivy you've taught us so much and you're not done teaching us and you're not done teaching her. So thank you, Jesus. Lord, we pray for protection, for health, and for wholeness over her, for true identity within her. Jesus, that you would be the center. In your name we pray. Amen. Congratulations, Ivy, on graduating in 2023. So we're just going to give you a round of applause for that. <laughs> At this time, we're going to dismiss our children for our, our their worship downstairs. And we are going to continue to worship up here. Just realize that. Uh, hopefully. As we continue in worship, you are free to stand if you so desire, and we will continue to worship up here. Check. Did you get premium on music?
presence for a while this morning, Lord. We open ourselves to you. You've heard us this morning cry out for your presence to, to look deep into our hearts this morning to, to help us to lay down those things that, that hinder, that keep us apart. Just continue your cleansing this morning, Father, as we bow, as we as we, we kneel before you this morning, as we lay our hearts low in your presence, Lord, speak your truth into our lives.
glory. We've been obedient to the Holy Spirit so far. on my heart so I'm going to share it and I don't even have the whole thing so I may need some help with what this is about but I've been thinking a lot I've read about Death Valley did anybody know where Death Valley is it's in California and it's one of the hottest places anywhere okay it's extremely hot and for the most part it's called Death Valley because things don't live there much okay it's it's so hot it's so dry that nothing's there. About once every 10 to 15 years, it gets enough rain that it has what's called a super bloom. Now in the spring, sometimes a few flowers come up, but when there's rain, it has a super bloom. And you could look out and the whole valley is covered in purple and yellow flowers. And it's, it's, it's such a phenomenon that people come when, it, when they have a super bloom, people come and take pictures of it because it's just so wild that this, this really dry desert <coughs> blooms. The desert blooms. And what made the difference? The rain. The rain. Water from heaven. That's what makes the difference. The seeds were already there. They were just waiting, right? The seeds were there. They were in the, in the desert. The seeds were there waiting. And the rain made the difference. Look at them. I don't know what you see, but I have ideas when I'm, I'm doing the front. And it's about Genesis. And it's about God speaking to the earth life. And the flower makes life, and the flowers grow. And the reason this cross is there is because after Jesus, this Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit came and brought life where otherwise there was death. And the Holy Spirit wants to do that for us. We need the rain. We need the Holy Spirit to come and water us and bring rain so that, so that what's, what's been dead, where the seeds are, that they would bring life. Free that where there's death, as we pray and we call on God to bring down the rain, that there will be flowers again, that there will be life again. We're going to test that word. We're going to accept that as a word from the Lord. Even death can't stop the rain. That's good. Yeah. Amen. We're going to pray for our messengers. Mary and uh, Russell are in junior church. And Todd the nursery is Pastor Debbie and Josiah. And Pastor Kim will be our sermon ups here. So we'll pray for them. Father, I ask that you would just bless our children's ministry. And for those that are doing the children's ministry, God, I ask that you give them words and um, that their crafts and their games and everything that would go well and that we would teach our children to walk with you. And God, I ask for those that are up here that we would hear your words and that we would be teachable as well. That we would hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you very fruitful. I will make you nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between you and me and your descendants after you for the generations to come, and to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Amen. Jacob, can you hand me my phone, please? Thanks. Yes, my phone. Thank you. All right. Okay, I've got all of my notes, I think. We'll see. All right, so... Before we start into Genesis, last night there was something heavy um, on my heart. Uh, We do Bible time of different forms every night with our kids, um, the littles or my kids and under. We do something sort of different. Either we will watch uh, Phil TV or Phil Fisher um, has something called Phil TV. He was the producer and creator of VeggieTales originally and What's in the Bible. He does a really great job Um, and he walks through all the concepts of the Bible, but hard concepts and makes them explainable for children. One of the best children's ministers that has come out since I was a kid. And he said something last night that has really stuck with me. And it's based on his study in 1 John. And he said, we don't do things or try to live a life doing the right things to make God love us, but because he loves us. We do those things We can't earn it. So we do those things for the Lord because we are doing them from the love of the Lord. As we look at circumcision in the promise today, this is something that I want to be core to us. Because as I said, you cannot earn what is already yours this morning. So here we go. Genesis 17. Thank you, Kevy, for reading verses 1 through 8 for me. When Abraham was 75, he left Haran. That was in Genesis 12. When he was 86, that is when Ishmael was born, Genesis 16. Pastor Kent touched on that. And in the first two phrases, the first two verses, it says, I am almighty God, walk blameless, therefore before me. This is a moment of revelation that leads to an understanding. First, as it is true of most people, if I don't know you, and maybe this, maybe this is just being the strong will and not trusting person I am, but if I don't know you and I don't know your heart, I'm not going to trust your instruction. And I think that's true for most people. If you don't know the heart of something, it's really hard for you to sign on or grab onto a vision. If you don't understand the heart behind it. And I think that the Lord created us in some ways about that, which is also why he desires to be known. God was showing up saying, this is who I am. He was sharing who he was in that moment. I am El Shaddai. Another translation of this that I am the Almighty or One who has his hands on everything. The word blameless, because he says, I am the Almighty, therefore walk blameless before me. The word blameless here is translated to whole or wholeness. Within the beginning statement, the Lord is sharing a beautiful proclamation. 
I am the one who is in control of everything and I have it all in my hands. Walk in wholeness and partnership to this idea. There's a reason why we can reread the Bible our whole lives and still get new messages. Our God is multifaceted that way, and the Bible is written with equal measure. I am the one who is in control of everything. I have it in my hands. Walk in wholeness and partnership with this idea. I want to walk in that way. I want to walk in a way that shows I trust God to have it all. I want that kind of wholeness. This was already the commitment God wanted from and of Abraham. Looking at verses 3 through 8, God refers to specific terms of the covenant. And it's that he has not forgotten. Remember that he first established his covenant with Abraham before now. And he has repeatedly visited with Abraham throughout time. And it says that Abraham fell on his face. And God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father of many nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but Abraham. Abraham fell on his face. As this is an act of worship in a personal, when God shows up in a personal way right in front of your face, I'm, I'm curious I, for myself. I don't know how I would react. <laughs> in some ways, I feel a little unnerved by that. In other ways, I think I would be in awe. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. To show Abram's faith in the promises of his descendants through Sarai, God changed Abram's name. Abram actually means father of many. Abraham means father of many nations. It seems like such a subtle difference, but it's a world of difference in the kingdom of heaven. To encourage Abraham's faith and to ensure his promise, there was no doubt in the sense father of many was a hard name to bear for a man who had no children. Or at this point, only had one child. Not through the one that God wanted to continue his line. It was a weird time because in this culture, they had as many children as they possibly could. Okay? That showed strength, numbers. And Abram had prosperity in his culture. We know this. Him and Lot had to separate due to the amount of things they had being too much. But he did not. He was not walking out the title in his name. At the time, he was not father of many, let alone father of nations, when this was spoken over him. God had made a promise of a people group, a nation, to Abraham before this. And I always said, well, God made a lot of promises or repeated his promises to Abraham. That's how I felt a lot when reading this. But it's not true. Actually, before now, he had made a promise of one nation. But we have seen the promise expanded with Abram's identity and name. He would not just be father of one people group. He would be father of nations. I'm not a prosperity preacher, but I am a person who is after truth and identity, wholeness, and promise. And I believe God intervenes and intertwines these ideas. So as he was expanding Abraham, he was also expanding the idea of his kingdom. (laughs) 
So if God was in the mix of expanding his kingdom through what felt like a long delayed promise he made to Abram 25 years previous to this, when he was already an old dude, and he wasn't the youngest of the old dudes, Troy. Could this God be expanding the plan on your behalf this morning? You see, from most fruit, you will see multiple seeds. Because my God is a God of multiplication. It's weird to think that when Abraham announced his name change to others, they might have thought he wanted to escape the burden, but actually he increased the burden. As we said, at this point, he would have only had Ishmael. But he is not the only man in the Bible whose name was changed. Right? We know of Jacob. His name was changed to Israel, which would be the title of a nation and is still the title of a nation. And that is later in Genesis. And then he changed Simon's name to Peter, which was to be the rock on which he would build his church. And God promises a wonderful new name to every overcomer in him. That's in Revelation. God gives us in the kingdom many names in faith. Some examples, saint, righteous, chosen, royal priesthood, sons and daughters of God, and the list goes on. And he knows he will accomplish the meaning of those names in us, even if to us it seems unlikely or even crazy. If God could create nations from a man who didn't even start having kids till he was 85, what can he do with you? Part of the identity shift was to create a way to set them apart, though. We're going to look at verses 9 through 14. Someone say here when you've got it. Got one here. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male throughout your generations, whether born in the house or brought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from my people. He has broken my covenant. We're going to talk a little bit about circumcision today, <laughs> but I'm not going to stick on the graphic details. However, this was Israel's way of being separated and called out by our, our God. This is my covenant, which you shall keep. God introduced the command regarding circumcision with these words. The cutting and removing of the foreskin of every male among Abraham's covenant descendants would mark them as those who were in covenant since the covenant was made with the literal genetic descendants of Abraham throughout the promise of God. It was appropriate that this sign of the covenant be given to those born into the covenant. 
and was associated with the reproducing part of the body. Circumcision indicated to those of Abraham that there was a defilement of the flesh in man, which must forever be taken away, and man would re remain impure and out of covenant with God. See, circumcision is this weird concept, and I mean, most males in our society, after talking with Mary, who does work and help deliver babies, get circumcised. It's not everybody, but it's most people. But this was a practical thing in that society, as well as it showed that these people belong to God. Circumcision was not unknown in the world at the time. It was a ritual that was practiced among various types of peoples. There was undoubtedly hygienic reasons, especially making sense in the ancient world. But most importantly, circumcision is a cutting away of the flesh. It is a sign of the covenant for those who should put no trust in the flesh. This was also due to the fact that the Abrahamic line, it was a way to show the line, those who belong to Abraham would also produce the line of Christ. It did set them apart. And this morning, I do want to, us to inwardly focus on what sets us apart. What makes us different when we live for God? when we're called by God, when we are identified as people of the living God, how are we set apart? <clears throat> the promise is stated that a son will come through Sarah. Now, Last week, Pastor Kent shared on, it's last week, right? Pastor Kent shared? Two weeks ago. Pastor Kent shared on, I was in children's ministry last week, that's why. Um, on the rushing of the promise a little bit, Sarah did not see, or Sarai at the time, did not see herself conceiving and bearing a child. So we ended up with, the Hagar and Ishmael situation, which is in Genesis 16. But 17 verses 15 through 16 says, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai anymore, but, you, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and I will also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be the mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. God wasn't just expanding Abraham's identity and promise. He expanded Sarah's. Because once again, the name shift is so minute, so little, that it only could make all the difference in the kingdom of God. Sarai is actually still, it means princess or my lady, but it is conformed to only a family area. Your family has hold of that name. You are theirs. When it changed to Sarah, Sarah signifies lady or again, or princess, but simply and absolutely without restriction. She is the princess of multitudes. She would produce many. By emphasizing the word her, I will bless her and I will give her a son. God made it plain that this son will not come through another surrogate mother situation as it did with Hagar and Ishmael. Sarah herself would give birth even though it was past her time to do so. She was 90 years old. I have no desire to give birth now let alone at 90 years old. 
I cannot imagine. But God was establishing his kingdom. Something that I found interesting is as he's walking through this and he's establishing this identity, there's a small but fierce warning about those who are not circumcised. It says that they will be cut off from the people. That if you refuse to circumcise your, your children, your sons, yourselves, you don't belong to me. And I began to ask the Lord, okay, what, is, what are we supposed to take from this weird portion of Scripture <laughs> that definitely showed set apart, kind of weird, kind of graphic? And the Lord said, well, what have you not cut off of yourself that keeps you from me? What have you not taken off that keeps you from entering my presence? Because although these rules are not established anymore, Galatians says, neither Greek nor slave, circumcised or uncircumcised, you can belong to the kingdom of heaven. But what have we taken on in our lives that should be taken off? See, the thing is, is God didn't just change and set apart. He shifted Abraham and his wife into a place where not only did the miraculous happen, but he was working on recreating and creating in his people. How do we live a life that shows faith and grace of being identified and set apart? What does our spiritual circumstance and circumcision look like? God repeats the promise in 19 through 22 and the names, and names the child who will come from Abraham and Sarah. Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. The son will be named Isaac because he would be such a joy to his parents, but also to always remind Abraham and Sarah of God's promise at this late time and age. It says that Sarah and Abraham, their response to the Lord when they said, you're going to have a baby at this time was to laugh. You're going to have a baby at 99 years old and 90 years old. I would laugh too. No, I would laugh too. So Isaac actually means laughter. And I don't find that the Lord was offended by this. I think he has a sense of humor because I have known more than one occasion where I'm like, why is this even possible, God? How is this being accomplished through the most intense and yet crazy circumstances? Our king constantly overwhelms us, overrides us, <laughs> takes control of the situation and shifts it for our good and his glory. Because if it's not God, it's not good. And I believe that wholeheartedly. You know, last year I was really, I wasn't angry, but I was frustrated about having to work this other job that was taking all of my time. And I was working 40 hours a week. and. And don't get me wrong, I was good at my job. And I was like, Lord, I don't, I feel like I'm, I'm wasting my time. 
what are you wanting me to do with this? And I think I've, I've shared part of this, but I came very close to my trainer who then got me the supervisor position. And, and sure, I was grateful for the Lord's favor, but as I said, I don't, I believe in blessing. I don't believe in a prosperity gospel. So I was like, Lord, what is your purpose? What am I supposed to do with this position? And it wasn't until my last week on position or the week before my last week on position where I was like, Lord, I just feel like I've wasted my time on this job. I don't know what, what you're trying to accomplish with this. And that trainer who ended up being a co-supervisor with me goes, you know, I need to talk, I need to tell you something. And I was like, okay. And I had been sharing here and there with her, but I did not know that now she was, she was a living, walking testimony. And the weekend this is the week after Easter, the weekend of Easter. She walked in, and she had been attending a church, which I knew nothing about. <laughs> and the Lord spoke straight to her and her husband through that message. And that very day, she was baptized. And she has decided to walk with the Lord. Her and her husband both have decided to walk with the Lord, and their children are now in church. And I believe firmly that that's why I had that position was so that Tiari would know the Lord. And so her family and those she's connected to, she's Hispanic and she's got a large family. They, that they would be connected and they would know the Lord. I saw it as a waste of time, but the Lord saw it as an opportunity. So we have to be so careful not to undermine the, our seasons that feel stressful, hard, or like they're a waste of time because the Lord wastes nothing. He wastes nothing. And he hadn't wasted time with Abraham and Sarah, even though it had felt like a long, long delay to see the promise. And yes, they had made mistakes along the way, but he was affirming in them a faith and an identity and a purpose and wholeness that would carry through a nation of people, nations of people. He was building early what would need to be great. As he said, kingdoms would come from you. The line of David came from the line of Abraham. The line of Moses came from the line of Abraham. Do not undersell what the Lord could bring from you, your walk in your life. Because if you undersell yourself, you are not walking in identity and purpose and wholeness. The Jewish people have a tradition where they, they will say shalom when they greet each other and when they leave each other, or shalom, shalom. It means peace, but actually it means wholeness. And shalom, shalom means perfect wholeness. In order to walk the life that the Lord has laid out for you, what needs cut off, what needs circumcised out of your life that belongs with the flesh, because God has called you further and into deeper things than you could imagine. It may not be easy, but it is worth it. And if it is not God, it is not good. God took his covenant so seriously. You can see that. You read that throughout all of the Bible. I'm, I'm in the middle of reading a book. I, I love I love to read, but Gene Edwards, he has this, there are a bunch of small books and they're very, um, they're written almost like plays. And the first book, and it's my favorite book if you ever want to read it, is The Tale of Three Kings. It's a fantastic book. Anybody in leadership should read it. The second one is The Man in the Third Cell and it follows John the Baptist. And the last one is The Story of Creation. And I'm in the last story. And God does this crazy conversation with himself. And it follows and kind of shares from the point of view of, of the angels. 
And it starts to paint this picture that they can't quite see in creation where God was not enough for Adam, so he pulled out of Adam Eve to make him whole. And you see him creating all of these partners, two lions, two tigers, two elephants, And then you see the fall and post the fall and you see that the Lord is getting ready to come and be with us, come dwell among us. And you start to see as he's writing this story through the Old Testament, the angels start to see God's people not as a bunch of different people, but as the bride, as God's counterpart in love and that they need to be drawn back to him to create complete wholeness. And it's so, it's so poetic, but it's so well done. And as I was praying through that story, I'm, I'm reminded of how hard it must be to love someone who doesn't always love you back or who doesn't love you well. How he called Hosea to love a woman who would leave him, cheat on him, make herself a literal whore. And then he compared the bride of Israel, the bride that was Israel, to her. And I had to ask myself, Lord, are we better? You made a way, but are we better? How often would I lean into escapes when I'm stressed out? How easy it is to scroll on my phone, to play games, to read a book that isn't the Bible or scripture-based. How easy it is for me to focus. And I'm not saying all those things are bad, but if it's separating you from the love of Jesus Christ and it's separating you from the, the groom, it's costing you too much. It's too high a price. Because Jesus already paid the most ultimate price. God takes his covenant with us seriously. And under the new covenant, he still takes that seriously. God took this so seriously that in Exodus, as Moses was on his way back into Egypt to rescue God's people, he was almost killed for not circumcising his children. Zipporah, his wife, had to do that in the middle of a desert (laughs) to save Moses' life because God takes it seriously. Your call like Abraham, Isaac, Moses, David, all of the greats is full of the promise, but it is not above the call to walk blameless, humbly and full of wholeness before your God. Your call, your anointing, your gifting, it doesn't matter if you don't choose a life that honors the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is the biggest thing you could do. That is the biggest part of our identity is that I know that Jesus paid a high price. He died on a Christ to save me for my sins and he was rose again so that I would have victory but also so I could walk blamelessly in wholeness in partnership with the almighty God who declared himself, I have it under control and it is in my hands from the very beginning. This is not a particularly long sermon, but I have some scriptures that I'm going to read before I end if someone wants to go and tap on Mary. These are scriptures that are based out of covenant and the idea of circumcision. And the biggest thing that we have to circumcise is our hearts. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God? Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. I believe Deb read it the first time this morning. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart 
and with all your soul that you may live. Philippians 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and in the glory of Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And finally, Colossians 2. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus, I thank you that you are still calling us to take off things that don't belong so that we may live a life fully, holy, and righteously before you. God, that you are still giving us chance after chance and that your grace covers a multitude. Father, I am so grateful that you are bigger and better than anything I can imagine and that you multiply in us what Satan would like to take away, what the enemy would like to rob us of, you multiply so we have more than enough. That you are exceedingly better than my understanding. Father, help us to be in understanding with you that, God, we trust more than anything that you have it all together, even when we don't. And Lord, the choice to walk with you, before you, blameless and whole, is still before us. Help us to choose you on every occasion. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'd like to take a moment for us to just allow the Holy Spirit to speak. As we were ending that first portion of worship and, and we were just allowing the Holy Spirit to, to minister while we were worshiping earlier, I was trying to discern what, what the Holy Spirit was, was speaking, what he was moving on our hearts. And, and as I've been sitting in, in the rest of this service and listening to the sermon and the word, I believe that maybe there's somebody here this morning that's got something that on their heart that, that, that they'd like to ask God for, that they're seeking the Lord for. not sure how to ask or if they should ask and there's the scripture that, that Jesus taught about being persistent to, to ask and you'll receive, to seek and you'll find and to knock and the, the door will be open that, that there's plenty of scripture that encourages us to be persistent 
And so if, if that's something that, that's been on your heart, then uh, I would encourage you to seek the Lord this morning for, for whatever it is that, that, that you're, you're looking for. And the, the altar is open. The, the pastors are here to pray. Or maybe you, you've, you've asked for something and you just felt like, like Abraham. It's, it's not happening. The altar is open this morning, and, and the, the, the Holy Spirit is here. His presence is here, and I believe that he will answer this morning. So don't be afraid to, to come into his presence. Don't be afraid to come for prayer. Don't be afraid to allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in your heart this morning. everybody in bed obedience to the Holy Spirit. If so, we will end our live stream and pray for those that are on our live stream. Jesus, I thank you for those that are watching. I ask that you bless and be with and change our hearts, that we would shed away the things that are not of you so that we could walk closer to you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.